for performance by an actress in a leading role. Will Barbie dance the night away with more nominations? There's some drama, you said. Yes, well, the Barbie movie. The Oscar nominations are out, and I am foaming at the mouth. Let me see if I understand this. The Academy nominated Barbie for Best Picture, eight nominations total, a film about women being sidelined and rendered invisible in patriarchal structures, but not the woman who directed the film. I think that when you make a movie that has that much kind of cleverness to it, that much weight to it in terms of the way that it appealed to audiences, the pop culture uh, impact that it made, uh, that doesn't happen by itself. Greta Gerwig and Margot Robbie were as crucial to Barbie's critical and commercial success as Nolan and Killian Murphy were to Oppenheimer's. Imagine the uproar if one or both of these men had been snubbed. It's wild how Barbie is Oscar-worthy, but not the women who made it so. Despite becoming the highest grossing female director of all time at the domestic box office after the success of Barbie, Greta Gerwig did not receive a nomination in the Best Directing category. So Barbie all around here, considering that it was the biggest success of last year at the movies, I think got done dirty by the Academy. Greta, Margot, while it can sting to win in the box office, but not take home the gold, your millions of fans love you. You're both so much more than Knuff. Hashtag Hillary Barbie. The white women are white womening again. <laughs> oh, girl. Listen, this is not about the Oscars, okay? Because y'all know I love to take a bit of pop culture, something happening in the zeitgeist, a bit of whatever culture wars bullshit, and take it into some theory and some philosophy and some speculation. So that's what we're doing on today. We will touch upon what happened with the Oscars and why the girls are upset, probably more upset than Margot and Greta are, or I can't assume their feelings, but you know. White feminism, what exactly does it mean? Do you have to be white to participate in white feminist antics? Hint, hint, no you don't. Cause it's about white supremacy and I'm using that word on purpose. I know people throw it around a lot, but I'm using that word on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> wait, 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 wait. As well as discussing some intersectionality, the girl boss feminism brand that we seem to adopt in this hemisphere, this corner of the world. And what's the issue with it being white centered? Because feminism has always had this issue. This isn't a new issue. If you read feminist writers that are not white, you can tell that it is, it's been going on from time. So we're gonna talk about that and some of them. But first, bonjour na kam, hi. Welcome slash welcome back to my channel. My name's Khadija. If you're new, feel free to take a look around, suss out the vibe. I just sit in my living room and talk about whatever I want. And today I wanna talk about feminism, the white feminism, because I really, y'all, come on, y'all are better than this. Let's, let's figure this out. But before we do that, Shout out to today's sponsor. For the ladies wanted to get their sexual pleasure, Balesa. Don't worry, I see the irony because I'm gonna talk about something later that has to do with capitalism and feminism. I see the irony, y'all, but the bills gotta get paid, okay? So let's thank Balesa. Tony said, Balesa, girl, let me get on in the gig. <laughs> You wanna tell them about Balesa, Tony? Balesa is a by women company, not by women, but a company by women. Although that too, for all things sexual wellness. Balesa's mission is about empowering everyone to embrace, explore, and celebrate their sensuality. Isn't that beautiful, Tony Baloney? And guess what, Tony and audience? They're doing a giveaway! Literally free toys and gift cards to toys. All you gotta do is click the link in my description. And if you want a glimpse of some of those toys, cause I've been trying them out for months now. Woo, let me tell ya. And we got the Demi wand. It's compact, discreet, it's come with this cute little charging case. It's also waterproof, USB chargeable, and no weird pattern modes, cause you know. Works for all body types, which means orgasms for all. Then we've got the air vibe. This one's about dual stimulation, internally and externally, if you know what I'm saying. It comes in this cute discreet case as well. It's waterproof, rechargeable, and silent, but deadly. And then you have my new favorite, cause there, I had some favorites before, but this, this girl right here, this one right here, she is, oh, oh. if you use nothing else, use this one. Oh, Jesus. Amen. Ain't that right? The pebble is suction and vibration controlled independently. It's ergonomically built to fit perfectly your hand and it do when you're in compromising positions. <laughs> 
Oh my God. And it also doesn't have any annoying pattern modes. So I know winter time is lonely and cold and tiring, but if you're somebody that likes an orgasm or two, wants to explore your sensuality, your sexuality, and have some fun with some toys, check out the link in my description. And thank you so much to Belessa for sponsoring this portion of today's video. And thanks to y'all for supporting a brand that supports this channel. All right, let's get back into it. So quickly, what had happened? Basically, the Oscar nominations came out. The girls noticed Barbie got a lot of nominations, but... There were a couple that were missing, including Best Director for Greta Gerwig and Best Actress for Margot Robbie. Now, the Best Actress and Best Director categories are always competitive no matter what, so off rip, it was gonna be tough, especially because this was a really good year for films. I'm not just saying that because I've heard other people say it. I've actually watched and have been getting through a lot of the films that were nominated. And yeah, the movies, the movies are good, girl. But anyway, nobody cared about that. They just cared about the optics of this whole movie was about women being sidelined and what was I made for and blah, 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 blah. And then y'all just completely pushed Greta and Margot to the side. And they were the ones who were championing this, especially Margot Robbie championing it to get it made and blah, 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 blah. Margot was still nominated, girl. She's a producer. If they win, she will get an Oscar for producing that movie. So will Greta. And Greta also wrote the screenplay. So she's nominated for that. America Ferrera, one of her castmates, which is a nomination that honestly, I think is just because of that monologue she made. It's kind of whatever to me, but anyway. She's the first actress of Honduras descent to be nominated for an Oscar. Killers of the Flower Moon. Lily Gladstone put her bleh into that role, okay? I don't even know if you love me anymore. Of course I love you and kill these men who killed my family. She was acting. And then when you hear them talk, they're just so chill and have such good vibes. Lily, I fucks with you. I don't know you, it's a little parasocial, but what's up? First indigenous person to be nominated for an Oscar. Those are things that should be celebrated. Women's achievements that should be celebrated. There are three women in the directing category that are me from the editing bay. I <laughs> meant to say there are three best picture nominees that were all directed by women. That's what I meant to say. Which just goes to show the directing category yeah, lacks representation, but three of the nominees for best picture three of the films were directed by women. I make that mistake a couple of times, so I'm just adding it in here. That's something to be celebrated. And we can talk all day long about how the Oscars really need to get their shit together. And it is pretty misogynistic. Most of the time it's just men, but like, I think I read somewhere that Christopher Nolan, this is his first Oscar nomination. Correcting more false statements. This is why you need to fact check even yourself. Christopher Nolan, this is his second nomination. The first one was for Dunkirk. This is the first time though people think he, not the first time, but this is the time people think he will actually win because Oppenheimer, but you know, whatever. Anyway, this is his second nomination, first one. Uh, I know he's a white man, but still, he's made good. Listen, if the shit slaps, the shit slaps. Interstellar is one of my favorite movies of all time. No, don't let me leave, Murph. <laughs> Matthew McConaughey did not get an Oscar nomination for that and I, I'll never understand it. But I won't understand a lot of things about Oscar nominations. We're on the other side of the curtain. Either way. <coughs> People were upset that Greta and Margot weren't nominated and not necessarily that America was nominated instead because she's nominated for supporting actress, but that Ryan Gosling was nominated, but Margot wasn't. And I can see your point. It's like they were both in the same movie. I'm not gonna lie though. Ryan shined a little bit brighter in that movie. He did, he did. I'm gonna say it. It was a good time. Ryan was fun. It's not the patriarchy at work saying the man did a better job in the movie. I'm not even saying he did a better job. I'm saying his character was more fun. Whereas Margot's was kind of the straight man. And the straight man doesn't always get as much credit, especially in a comedy, because they don't, they, they're not the antics. They're the ones to keep everything on the up and up, to keep everything moving. Also, I don't necessarily think Ryan or America Ferrera should have been nominated for the Barbie movie, but I've watched America Ferrera since I was a kid and gotta kick it up, man. Si se puede, baby, si se puede. And Ryan Gosling has been in a lot of things too, and I don't think he's ever gotten an Oscar win. So maybe this was like a career Oscar. They do that a lot. And this year, Angela Labassa got her honorary Oscar. So honestly, at the end of the day, these awards, we don't know what's going on behind the scenes. We don't know what campaigning is going on behind the scenes for people to get nominated because part of it is that you have to submit your name and campaign for people to vote for you. And it's a certain group of people that are voting. It's not us voting. Sometimes the Oscars gets it and sometimes they miss the mark. Either way, the upset that a lot of folks had on this was giving the peakness 
of white feminism because people were trying to make it a women's issue that Margot and Greta weren't nominated and didn't get an Oscar and how dare the Oscars and this is the kind of world we live in where women don't get recognized for their achievements and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, okay, I need us all to take a step back and really consider the fact that their Oscar nomination might, yeah, do something for film and television, whatever, but at the end of the day, the reason they're gonna be able to do whatever they want for their next projects is not because they win Oscars or got nominated for them, but because Barbie racked in so much money, these companies are like, more of that. The Mattel Cinematic Universe, less go. Money is a thing that's going to actually move things along when it comes to movies, TV shows, films, whatever. You could be nominated for Oscars, win them, and then not do that much work after. People talk about the Oscar curse all the time. Oscars, they're great, but it's the optics of it. And y'all care more about the optics when it comes to feminism than you do about actual feminism. And that's where I take issue. Damn, I didn't expect to say that, but here we are. All of that happened. And then of course, Hillary Clinton entered the chat and Hillary Clinton is, is peak white feminist. Is peak white feminism is, yeah. So it shouldn't have been a surprise that she entered, but she did. I don't think Margot or Greta asked her to, but she did. And somebody tweeted the wildest oversimplification I think I've read in a while of Margot and Greta not being nominated for a movie like Barbie. I now understand why we're not in the seventh year of Hillary Clinton's presidency. And I'm like, <laughs> with y'all oh my god uh, honestly i think even hillary would have made that that comparison i because the way she treated that greta margo you're more than kenna yeah okay we get it you have been slighted as a white woman because you didn't win the presidency and it's the exact same thing as these other white women not getting their awards in a place where people just treat white women like, I don't know. I say all of this to say, we can have conversations about the lack of representation in Hollywood, about the misogyny in Hollywood and at the Oscars that white women do have to deal with, yes. But in that same industry, uh, you have someone like Taraji Henson talking about how she's not even getting paid well. So she can't even be complaining about the fact that she didn't get an Oscar nomination. She's just talking about getting paid better. Lily Gladstone is the first ever indigenous person to be nominated for an Oscar. That should be something we're celebrating and looking to and being like, oh, maybe things are changing. This is a positive. This is incredible. And yet the pulling of focus on the white women that didn't get their nomination, the white women that girl bossed and did all the right things in this capitalist system. We brought people to the box office. We did it with a feminine touch, a feminism 101 for the girls. It wasn't too offensive, but it still did echo a lot of the sentiments that plenty of women, not even just white women, but plenty of women feel. And it made bank. And we're technically the reason Oppenheimer got as much as it did. Cause really the Barbenheimer campaign, y'all need to be honest. Barbie helped Oppenheimer get its views. Don't play with me, okay? We did it all right. And yet we didn't get the esteemed award that we're supposed to get. This accolade that lets us know that we're just as, if not better than the white men. And we're gonna talk more about white feminism in a moment, but I just need to speak about this little caveat for a second because in one of my fave books, Against White Feminism, I'll put it on the screen here. I reread it for this video. Rafia, y'all in the chat, is it Zachariah or Zachariah? Correct me, please. I think it's Rafia Zachariah, but in it, she talks about this tension after second wave feminism between working feminists, the ones that wanted to get jobs and have their rights and independence. You know, I wanna be able to get an apartment on my own, get a loan on my own, driver's license, all those things and the quote radical feminists that were fighting for more political change and seeing how that in third wave feminism, those are the ones that kind of won out. And that's where you saw the girls are doing it for themselves and can be just as tough as the men, can be just as boss-like as a man. If you replace a man in a CEO position with a woman, you won't have to worry about any difference in how they communicate or carry on things because they'll be just as masculine as a man, but still add a feminine exterior. Capitalism relies on the individual and therefore it valorizes the individual. It finds politics and its agitation and collectivism a threat to its colonization of all human activity for the purpose of profit, and so it demonizes it. The radical feminist, women who had organized collectively and whose demands for equality had been expressed collectively, 
and the cash-happy Cosmo girls, interested largely in amassing power in the form of economic capital, the latter had won. And somewhere along the line, those women that were working, that were part of the workforce, part of the labor force, became their own sort of market, became their own consumer block. The girls are making money and they want to spend it. Capitalism was like, yes, ladies, welcome. <laughs> But I think somewhere along the line, and these are points that Rafia Zakaria makes as well, but we mistaked the freedom and power to consume as the same thing as having political freedom and power. It's not the same. The problem was that the choices women had were largely constructed by market capitalism. Women, now seen as consumers, were repeatedly accosted with questions of whether they wanted this lipstick or that one, this purse or that one. But even as these specific choices were being presented, the actual realm of choices available to women was shrinking. Even as they became more powerful as consumers, or even as decision makers in their professional spheres, they became less powerful in defining the choices that they wanted. Women now could choose among multiple brands of laundry detergent, but deferred or neglected opportunities to organize politically to demand free childcare for all women. And if a lot of us cared more about feminism, we would know that. But we have too many white feminist shenanigans getting in the way of that. So let's actually break down what white feminist shenanigans are. So white feminism, who is she? What's the deal? Who's more likely to participate? Why all the shenanigans? As I like to do on this channel, I'm going to describe it as a personality with character traits, because I think that helps people focus in more on what I'm trying to say. And these are characteristics that I notice of white feminism, okay? So it's not gospel, it's not Hammurabi's code, girl, calm down. I'm just a bitch talking online. White feminism, she's white center. She cares about upholding white supremacy in this hierarchy of believing that whiteness is the center and the end all be all. And if white men are up there, white women are just below them. So anytime they don't get something that white men get easily, they're like, what the fuck? Ignoring the fact that there are plenty of other women that are not only women, but are also not white. And so the things that they have to deal with, these intersections of their identity that we like to talk about, intersectionality, yeah, that gets ignored with white feminist antics. Okay. There's also a lack of empathy with white feminist antics for anything that does not directly benefit white women or the women that look and are classed like them. And one question you're probably asking then, I saw plenty of women that were not white talking about Barbie and why it should have been nominated and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. That also has to do with where you live in the world and how you're classed. Because if you have a certain amount of privilege where it comes to class, your education level, literally how much money you have or how much money you have had and living in a part of the world, US and Canada, I'm talking about y'all girlies and other ones, but those are the places that I have lived. Living in a part of the world that allows you to ignore women's issues of the global South, women's issues just anywhere else that is not in your own backyard. These women don't look like you. They don't have the same cultural understanding as you, you to them. So instead of it really being about feminism, which, which is about women's issues, it becomes about certain women's issues. And in this part of the world, in this case, we say white women because a lot of times it's white women, but it doesn't mean you have to only be white to participate in white feminist antics, okay? Don't do me, don't do me. Cause I, re I read the material and have been reading the material. Some of y'all just watch these videos. <laughs> Wait, 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 wait. You know what, Khadija, don't do that. So let's try and tease out the issues that I personally have with white feminism, but that a lot of other feminist writers, thinkers, and just regular everyday people have noticed but haven't quite been able to articulate. And hopefully that helps y'all articulate some of these issues that you have with it too. Or if you participate in it, articulate, oh shit, maybe I am doing this behavior. Oh no! You know, cause listen, don't judge yourself too harshly, but also you know better, do better, agree? We can, cool, okay. Months ago, I asked y'all on a community post if you knew what intersectionality was and varying responses, but it seems like there's a lot of confusion in the air because words fly out of everyone's mouth online, especially if you don't know what those words mean, you can very easily oversimplify the terms. I love to simplify things to make it make sense, but some things require more nuance. Intersectionality is one of those things because it speaks to the unique oppressions that black women face, it's not only black women, because other theorists and writers and things like that have used intersectionality as a framework to understand their own oppressions and the intersections of those identities and oppressions. But in this case specifically, Kimberly Crenshaw, a black woman was like, listen, the girls, the girls are not understanding 
that as a black woman, let's say in the workforce, if you were dealing with discrimination from your boss, that is not just about race, but also about gender, that's a place that you fit in that is unique to you as your experience because of those identities. But a lot of times people expect black women to choose between either dealing with racial oppression or gender oppression and not understanding that there is a place that we fit into where both of those things are happening sometimes simultaneously. Add being queer on top of that. Add being a trans woman on top of that. Add being a poor black woman on top of that. Add having a disability. Girl, y'all need to, ooh. You know, in that Vice debate from months ago that I was rolling my eyes at the whole time, one of the girls says something like, this is where intersectionality falls off the map and loses people because we got to count every single person. It's yes, yes, because those people are still women. And if you say you're a feminist and you like to deal with women's issues, then that means women's issues, all women. It doesn't just mean the women you like or the women that you are like, yeah, you're the only ones that I tolerate. Because whether or not you see those people as women or the same kind of women as you, they're still going to be dealing with the effects of a patriarchal system that is misogynistic. So I need us to, to really just focus in. And as I said before, intersectionality is an issue that feminists have been dealing with since feminism. <laughs> Since the day feminism was created, <laughs> it obviously wasn't a day, you know, you know. Sojourner Truth literally saying to all of these white women, ain't I a woman? Yes, y'all wanna talk about being able to vote and having the same rights as white men, but black women are dealing with the repercussions of slavery, are dealing with being enslaved, are dealing with being treated as black and the oppressions that come from that. And then on top of that, being a woman. Y'all, I need you to open your eyes, beloved. Come on now. <laughs> When I talk about white feminism and it being centered around certain types of women's issues, we're talking about white Western women classed of a certain level, education level, money level, all of that. Because you really do got to have a certain level of class, money and privilege to be out here complaining about an Oscar nomination when women in Gaza are having C-sections without anesthesia. You really gotta be so pink-pilled that you think that fighting an Oscar nomination is the same thing as the fact that 10 million Sudanese people have been displaced since April, 2023. And a lot of those people are women. If you care more about that than women in Gambia being capsized in a boat because they're trying to escape somewhere for a better life and are willing to do anything to take what they call the back route, what we call in Gambia or in Wolof, to Yoni Ditch, call to the ocean. They're trying to survive. And I know that's an extreme example to compare it to, but I'm just saying, Kim, people are dying. When your brand of feminism, and I'm calling it a brand on purpose, but when your brand of feminism is only about women that look like you, women that are class like you, and women that deal with the exact same issues as you, that's not feminism. That's just, I care about certain women. So just call it that. I care about certain women's issues. I don't care about feminism. Just, just say that. Just say you're more likely going to get upset if a white woman that you look up to doesn't get nominated for an award, even though this was a great year for Lots of people to be nominated, women included, women that are not white included. Anyway, what was I saying? And there are a couple of things happening here. And again, I'll get to some of this in my final thoughts because I think it does have a bit to do with the lack of control a lot of us feel in what we can do in places where people are distant from us in space. People are in different parts of the world. What can I really do from here to help those women? That might be part of it too, giving y'all the benefit of the doubt, not saying you only care about this stuff, but you're like, I can't do anything about that, but I can complain on Twitter about an Oscar nomination. I see it, I get it, we'll talk about it. But I'm always trying to ask y'all to stretch your empathy, to stretch that muscle and that compassion. It's something I'm working on for myself and for those around me. And I'm also gonna ask y'all to do it too, because it requires a certain level of stretching and practicing that empathy muscle to where even if you cannot physically be there or do something or change a law or whatever to help these women in different parts of the world, you still care enough to learn about what the issues are that these women are facing. You care enough to educate yourself, to educate those around you, and to then hopefully 
bringing more awareness to that brings more people that can bring solutions as well because you might not be the solutions person. You might be the learning girly or the bringing up whatever. But what are you doing for your part to really help feminism and feminist issues? And what are actual feminist issues to you? Because we could talk about the Oscars and their history of, yeah, mostly praising men for mediocre films. We could do that. And I would not fight you on that because I do agree. But this wasn't quite the year for it. And especially if you read The Room Girl, it wasn't the time. <laughs> Getting to it now, especially because a lot of us in this part of the world with the privileges and benefits of being able to have a lot of utilities and infrastructure that we take for granted. I always talk about having access to electricity all day, every day without brownouts or blackouts. Yeah, that's a privilege and a luxury because there are lots of parts of the world that don't have that. Lots of parts of the world where women live that don't have that. Imagine what it's like when you don't have access to power or electricity 24 hours of the day. What issues might come up from that? And that's one example that I use to illustrate the fact that you can be upset about something like a pop culture issue, Oscar nominations, such, whatever, but that is kind of a distraction from something that you could actually be doing. The girls in Hollywood, yes, they need to be fighting for their rights. They need to be doing all of that stuff, but they also live in a bit of a bubble away from you. They're not living the same life you are. And when it comes down to political issues, women's political issues that need to be dealt with, talked about, that a lot of us need to be educated on so that we know how to actually fight for them. Y'all were all surprised when abortion rights were taken away, when the Supreme Court was like, ah, girl, let the states handle it. A lot of y'all were shocked, gooped and gagged, but abortion rights activists, organizers, we're not surprised. They knew what was coming, but a lot of us didn't know because we're not educated on that. We don't know where to find the things, but also we don't take our initiative to look for the things, to find community organizers in our area, to find and know who our local representatives are. I'm not even talking about the big election this year. I'm talking about our local representatives. I worked with Courage for America in a previous video and I had people commenting like, I'm not gonna vote, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, yes, I understand that voting and everything looks ashy, but y'all, only show up every four years when there's a major election and don't consider the fact that like, there are plenty of other elections happening, plenty of other ways to show up with your vote that some folks are trying to take away from you, to show up with your vote and go, actually, yeah, I'm gonna vote for a representative that I want because clearly, the president and everything's acting wild and I need somebody that has my interest at heart. I'm gonna vote more at the local level. Understanding your local elections are important, not just for women's issues, but for any political issue. But yeah, we don't participate, we don't educate ourselves, and then we get upset when rights are taken away. And it's like, well, girl, you gotta know where, <laughs> and they don't make it easy. I'm not saying that it, it's easy to go out there and find these things, but it takes an intentional effort. And girl, in a white supremacist, patriarchal, capitalist system, using those words on purpose, one of the benefits, one of the ways that they can pivot, do a little Kim, is that they distract you enough to care more about something like an Oscar nomination as a stand-in of this is why women's rights aren't going anywhere, as opposed to actual political issues. Y'all, wake up. Listen, I am a performer. I've been a performer my whole life music, that theater kid energy. You know, I love it. And I think representation is really important. I've talked about it on this channel a lot, but I also have to look at myself and go, girl, representation is only gonna do so much. I've leaned into the representation so much because there is a certain amount of privilege that you can have when you sit and just talk about women's issues aren't going anywhere because of the Oscars. Girl! Representation, who we see in the media and the public, the repeated exposure of that is important and should be fought for. Population should be reflected in the media that you consume. It shouldn't just be one type of face or certain types of physical features. I agree 100%, we should fight for that. And it should not be a replacement for trying to enact actual political change. It shouldn't. Improv rules, y'all. Yes, and. So it's been a few days. I had forgotten to record a closing remarks for this video, so we're doing it now. Listen, um, what did I say in this video? <laughs> You don't have to be a white woman to participate in white women feminist antics. You don't. But a lot of y'all happen to be on the paler side that like to, or closer to proximity, closer in proximity to that. So 
That's what this is about. Some of y'all don't really care about the Oscars or who gets what award, because if you did, you would have been happy with so many other people that I mentioned getting their accolades, getting their flowers. It's okay to be upset that your fave didn't get nominated to feel like they got slighted and all of that. Plenty of us feel that way, but a lot of y'all are falsely equating the lack of representation and the fact that so many marginalized women have been closed out of these opportunities, have been closed out of receiving these awards, how every few years, even in the year 2024, we're like, oh, this is the first X nomination. Wow. I need you to know that we all know that white women deal with oppression, deal with discrimination, deal with misogyny. Yes. But y'all aren't the only ones that deal with that. Your oppression and misogyny that you deal with might be, as my therapist used to say, trauma with a lowercase t versus with a capital T, depending on where you live in the world. Because maybe you get boxed out of certain opportunities. For me, it's all about keeping perspective. That's just how I grew up. That's how I was raised. So that's, what I try to bring to this stuff. Yeah, it's not the best to be closed out of opportunities. Sometimes I be getting on here annoyed because I'm a black creator and sometimes it feels like you're fighting an uphill battle on the line with these damn algorithms, okay? I'm gonna be honest, I complain about it, it's upsetting. Sometimes it has to do with my complexion. It does have to do with my feminist, my darkness and my queerness, but I also still get to come online and make videos and do that from the comfort of my home. Whereas a lot of other queer, dark skinned femmes and women, they have to deal with a lot more. I'd say trauma with a capital T with regard to their intersecting identities and how they are oppressed as a result. It's not to say that we don't deal with oppression and all of that here. It's not to say that we shouldn't still keep fighting for representation and for our damn political rights. But it's to say, keep things into perspective, to remember that you are not the only person suffering in the world or your suffering isn't the center of the universe. That is something that I really, above all, want to get across, not just with white feminist antics, but with all of us that engage with discourse online. And I've been guilty of this too. So again, I usually, <laughs> when I'm saying this stuff, I know some of y'all feel attacked, but like, I don't know you, so I'm not talking specifically to you. This is just a general statement from what I'm observing and something that I've had to have, I've had to say, and things that I've had to say to myself or ask myself, am I participating in? A lot of us don't know how to depersonalize. We take everything personally, including Oscar nominations of people that we will never meet that do not know we exist. I'm just trying to say at the end of the day, you as an audience, you have more power than you think to either engage or not to be involved or not. You also have more power than you think politically to make more action and change so that you don't feel like the only way you can voice your opinion on political issues like feminism is online when it comes to pop culture issues. Cause yeah, we can definitely use them to talk about the things. That's what I, my whole job is, I get it. But we have more power than that. And if we don't, we should strive to have more power than that. Especially because in certain parts of the world, People have even less power than you. And a lot of those people are women. But you know, as always, the world is doing its thing and we're all just on it, rotating around a sun who might one day collapse within itself and pull us all into its deep gravitational pull. And since we really don't know what is inside of a singularity of a black hole, well, hopefully it, 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 it could be peace or just instant, instant death to relieve us all from all of this. Anyway, be sure to feed your plats, water your plats, and remember that you can always change your mind because you can or don't. Hey, listen, it's your life. And uh, yeah, I'll see you in the next one. Bye.